Hey, it's Steve. Welcome to another episode of the Rocket MSP podcast. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Mason Giles. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Okay. I, you know, I always get confused because there's like nine different ways to use letters, yeah. right? Odd so, yeah. So I'm joined by Mason Giles with Comet Backup. Mason, I'm super pumped to have you here, man. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So... Comment back up. I feel like backup is one of those things. It's like well, that's, that's kicking that's a dead horse, right? We all know everything there is to know about backup. You know, you you just put you you put the tape in the drive and you just oh, let okay. Symantec backup exec do its job. Ooh, ooh, okay. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> Here, but for the next hour. Yeah, well, you know. So so let's talk about well, let's talk about some <laughs> something useful. When it comes to backup, first of all, MSPs need a habit. Yeah, of, of course. It's a no brainer. As the MSP, you are the IT guy for one of these small businesses and enterprises out there. And when mm -hmm. something goes wrong with their computer, you're on the hook to fix it. And that means getting their data back when their computers get lost or stolen. It's something that you just need to have. It's also very easy to communicate that need to partners. Everyone's got a story of a PC being lost or stolen or crashing. You know, That's very true. I mean, I remember here's what, here's where it's going to get crazy. When I was about one minute, in, it's getting crazy already. Well, two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> so I was, I want to say 20 working at a movie theater. No, I'm 21 working at a movie theater and I'm transporting my computer from my old home to my new home. And work just happened to be kind of in between. So I've got the computer in my car along with whatever else. And on that computer, I have all this music that I had written. We're, we're talking 2005. So, you know, cloud backup didn't exist. You know, there, the Mosey wasn't even a thing, mm. man. And that's a throwback, right? Carbonite wasn't even thought of. So. I'm there, I'm working and I, I come out at the end of the shift and it's all gone. Everything's gone. Car broken into. Car got broken into. Well, I mean, it's not very hard to break into a car of a guy in his early twenties who doesn't have door locks that function. I remember the kind of cows I had in my early twenties. Yeah. So. You know, obviously there are steps that I should have taken even back then, like, you know, put the valuables in the trunk. Then it won't look like there's cool things to take. So it's always nice to learn from other people's mistakes rather than having to make them yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Thanks for that. When you make it yourself. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. Good. Yeah. You're a good guy. Sorry you went through that, but yeah, everyone's got a story like that, huh? It's okay. I remember one of the songs. There were dozens. It's not a problem. And that's why today I'm not a rock star, guys. It just wasn't meant to be. But just think, if you'd had COVID back up, it'd be a very different podcast. Is podcast is just going to be, but if you had comment back up. Oh, I'll, boy. I'll find out the blue team in you, though. <laughs> okay, so well, let's talk about that. I guess I one interesting thing, sorry, you mentioned about cloud backup not really being a thing. And that's um, something that, that has been a huge transition for, you know, the whole industry is um, moving everything to cloud storage and just the internet connection speed's getting better. You know, back in mm -hmm. 2005, would you have a 56K modem still, or would you have been on ADSL or? Oh, whoa, what do you think I'm in? Australia or something? No, I had DSL while I was still in, in high school back in 99. Done. I was downloading music at the speed of light in 99 off Napster, man. Nice, nice. So, no, in, in 2005, I probably had, what, what was the top speed back then, like 20? 20 oh, meg down and half a meg up. Since that half a meg up really makes backup struggle though. You know, if you've got 500 gigs of Napster MP3s to back up, then, you know, half a meg up takes a long time to get them anywhere. Certainly does. Which is why I didn't have cloud backup back then. Also because I liked to live life dangerously. So today though, like. You know, I don't really need cloud backup. You know, I've got my, my Mac 
you know, you, you never have to worry about anything going wrong on a Mac. It's been proven time and time again. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll, you know, like my backups, I just have time machine. I don't need cloud backup. That sounds overkill. You've got locks on your doors now, right? So no one's going to break in and steal your time machine. Exactly. Exactly. So how do MSPs overcome that objective? Because somebody breaking into a business to steal a backup drive seems pretty outlandish. Do you want to bid on it? Well, it's, it's not even about how outlandish it is. There's a hundred different situations. You know, we get a pretty bad earthquake here a few years back. Obviously, there's been all the fires and the heat dome in the U.S. Pacific Northwest recently. But I'm in Ohio. Nothing happens in Ohio. <laughs> okay. Mason, well, come on. Ohio, had, you, you know Nelson. what we had Sunday? It snowed. Whoa. What's the, is that usual for Ohio? Sorry, I don't know. I mean, Houston. yeah, the tail end or middle, I should say, of fall or autumn. And yeah, yeah, it can snow. I mean, it sometimes snows on Halloween. Well, I think we're just in the tail end of spring skiing, not spring skiing. It's, it's the perfect time where it's started to get warm down here in the Southern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. New Zealand, and, but there's still snow on the mountains from winter. Nice. Yeah, so, I think. so how, talk to me about this, you know, time machine thing though. Let's, let's yeah. be serious for a minute. How can an MSP, let's talk about the tiny MSP who maybe they don't have a sales team. It's the guy who is an awesome technician and thought I'll start a company. And then he learned there's all these things that he's not good at. Right. So how does this guy that's maybe not so great at sales overcome the objective from a client or a prospect when he says, I need to get you some cloud backups. And the client's like, dude, I've got time machine or I've got Dropbox. I don't need that. I guess the first thing I would say is that having a backup of any kind is great. I'm here to talk about backup and evangelize backup. Um, and if you've got something, anything, that is absolutely better than nothing. But the next question is what could be even better than what you've got? And that comes to looking at the threat models that you may be facing, whether that is, you know, building break-in or a natural disaster or robbery, all of these kind of situations. The, the other thing is, so obviously kind of backup mitigates those kind of risks. The other thing that I would consider is ransomware, whether the ransomware running on the Mac, which, you know, as you've mentioned, of course, Macs are perfect and, and never ever go wrong. But you know, Nothing ever goes wrong. Per perish the thought. If, if, if it were possible for a Mac to run ransomware, which it obviously is and does happen, can ransomware encrypt your time machine backups? And if those were off site, would there be less of a chance of that happening? But beyond that, I would talk about things like the consistency of the backup jobs, you know, when you put another file in Dropbox, has it synced yet? You don't know why. I mean, the little icon tells you that it's synced. With Comet, you have a bit more point in time snapshotting. So you can say at this exact moment of time, I know that everything in my selection is backed up. It's application consistent. And the last thing I would talk about is, and what's probably the real sell in the small MSP context is verifying, you know, I had a situation a few years ago now where I was helping a customer with their backups and that phoned up the company and said, Hey, I need all my emails back. And they would got a remote session, walk them through restoring the data and the emails were just not selected for backup at all. And that was a pretty heartbreaking moment, but it was very clear that there's a sort of observability gap as well for backups. Like is everything selected in Dropbox? Is Dropbox actually picking up everything? Is Time Machine picking up everything? Has this customer gone and installed new software or added new PCs and they're actually not configured to do those backups? So one of the neat things about Comet is you do have that remote observability. It's a client thing, client server thing. So you can see all your customers, you can look at what they're backing up and you can send them email reports about what's being backed up. It just gives them the bit more confidence that things aren't going wrong in the future. I think there's lots of positive aspects, you know, but Dropbox and Time Machine are a great start. Not going to talk anyone down for using them. So. Let's talk about the difference between backup and business continuity, because I think some MSPs will use these terms interchangeably because business continuity sounds cool, but all I'm really doing is installing, I don't know, backup, right? 
I got carbonite. I'm good. Like whatever they're using. How do we get them to understand the difference between a backup and true business continuity? Mm -hmm. Let's back up. What is true business continuity? Right. I would say, well, backup is one part of business continuity because being able to get your data back in, well, let's pick an emergency and, and talk through it. I guess ransomware is the most common kind of emergency that small businesses will face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. In the event of ransomware, having your backups is, you know, it's, it's the, well, ransomware breaks in in a lot of ways. You know, you're kind of expecting ransomware to come in through email phishing or something and your anti-spam should catch it. And if your anti-spam doesn't catch it, then hopefully your staff have anti-phishing training. Anti-phishing training is a um, really cool and interesting thing that you can upsell partners on doing, but it's, it's really surprising the rates of people that will click on phishing emails, even when they've had anti-phishing training, then it's, it's pretty depressing if you're going to look at those numbers. Uh, but you know, ransomware comes in by email. Maybe the anti-spam stops it. Maybe the anti-phishing training stops it. Runs on the PC, or maybe your antivirus, your ADR, CrowdStrike, something like that blocks it. But if Paris of Thought, it runs and does its thing, encrypts the files, then hopefully you've got backups. So backups is a preventative defense for um, the kind of business ending event, because there's a famous statistic that gets bandied around, which is something like, you know, if, if you lose all your data, then 40% of businesses go out of business more than a month or something like that. It's very oh, hard yeah, to The one to. I've seen is like 75% of businesses go out of business after a year, yeah, after right, a right. catastrophic, uh, data loss event. You know, I'm not actually sure of the exact providence of that citation, but I, I believe it. It's pretty believable. Sure. And you know, like 83% of all facts are made up. So I've hit 84, whatever. All yeah, right. So when you're going to, when you've got that backup data, getting the business back up and running, it's, it's not just about the backup, it's about the restore. It's about ransomware in particular is a pretty hot topic and in part around compliance. If you have to report a breach notification to your customers, things like that, just getting everything back up and running is, is about much more than just the data. So. Backups are important. I am no. hearing myself coming out of your speakers now. So, so backups are important and they are, I would say a critical component of business continuity, but more importantly, getting the business back up and running, or maybe keeping the business running during that period of, oh, we had an issue and now everything's back to normal. All of that is part of business continuity, which means. A plan is part of business continuity. Yeah, I would agree with that. This overlaps a little bit into what's also called disaster recovery. I don't know if IT is particularly susceptible to coming up with different names for broadly similar concepts, but we do talk a lot about disaster recovery as a concept. You know, if you have several machines that are all sitting on a ransomware lock screen, you know, hopefully you've uh, a disk image backup of that machine that you can virtual boot in the cloud, something like that to immediately get you back up and running. So let's talk about that. Datto is the company that always kind of comes to mind. No offense. When I think of, I've got a server and I need to have a backup of it and I need to be able to spin up a virtual version of that server, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. I think there's, there's a lot of products that can do it. Comet included. Comet does and that. We do support disk image backup. Yep. And you can take a disk image backup and boot it up any way you like. But here's the difference with Datto and even with some of these other solutions out there, they're starting to get more and more in the weeds with this. Datto will like, I don't know, every day or every hour or how, however often you tell it to do it, it's going to spin up a VM automatically and take a screenshot of like the Windows login screen. So you can see and prove that your backups boot. And then if something goes wrong, you hit a button, one button, I think, and it spins up that VM, that server or desktop is up and running. And then you just need to like, you know, configure some networking things and then it's live. Is Comet that, that easy? It might be about three clicks in Comet rather than one. But it's, it's definitely the kind of direction we're taking the product. So we launched our disk image backup support probably two or three years ago now. And so 
Cobalt is a very broad spectrum backup product. So as well as doing disk image backups for, for whole server environments that you can either boot in the cloud or boot in a local virtual machine or do a physical re-image, we also support, you know, file and folder backup and SQL server backup and Exchange server backup and Office 365 backup and all of these different types of things, disk image as well as all of these other types, all integrated in the same user interface and the same components. You've got the same sort of MSP top level visibility, no matter what kind of backup the customer really needs. So you get to see all of these server disk image backups in the same place as, as the customer's small file. Okay. So three buttons and I can spin up a VM of a Comet backup. Mm, yeah. Three buttons. Ish. ish. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then I'm sure I still have to go in and do the networking just like, you know, all the other ones. Right. So I'm not saying that three buttons and every, it's perfect and it's done and whatever. I'm just saying there's a way through the Comet backup software to spin up a VM. Yeah, yeah, sure. And is that local or in the cloud? You get the VHD and then it's two clicks in Hyper-V to import that into a virtual machine. Or you can send that to as your Google Cloud or AWS or any other cloud provider that supports VMDK import. Now, when you say send that to, are you saying, so I can use a comment to do local backups. That's just built in, right? Yeah, of course. So this is about, sorry, we're talking about something quite specific here, which is when you've done a backup job of a disk image and you, you want to restore that disk image and get it virtual booting somewhere. So that's definitely possible. But talking about where that disk image actually gets stored, supports a pretty dizzying array of different storage locations. So your backup data can be stored on local drops or, or it could be stored in the cloud already. Right. So, and I just wanted to make sure that I was clear, like, I can store it locally and then I can just boop. Now it's running on a different, a Hyper-V server or whatever, right? Yeah. I can store it in the cloud and, you know, there's the super cost-effective locations like Wasabi and some other ones that I never remember. Backblaze. Uh, B, Backblaze. Yeah, I was going to say Backblaze B2 and then, but there's a whole host of them, right? And AWS compatible type storage. What is it? S3 compatible? Three compatible, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's lots of them. You, you definitely get the main ones at five five dollars per terabyte per month. It's sort of the, the price point. That, that is astronomical, by the way. I'm kidding. So with with that kind of storage, that won't boot to like AWS, Azure, or Google. We would need to send the disk image backup to AWS, some type of drive or, or something in Microsoft or in Google. Yeah, of course. I, Wasabi and Backblaze only provide storage. They don't provide anything else. So that you're going to transfer things in and then transfer them out again. And not only that, Comet is obviously, when Comet does your disk image back, it's storing it compressed, it's storing it encrypted, it's storing it chunked and deduplicated. And so that is, is not, it's a highly efficient, highly secure storage format that's optimized for, you know, every different, you know, if you're doing daily disk image backups, for instance, optimizing storing those changes, but it's obviously not ready to go and ready to boot in a hypervisor until you reconstitute it back into a full-sized VHDX or VMDK. And so there's still that restore process when it comes from Wasabi back to your hypervisor's disk. So if, if I had to, to guess, I could easily say there are more than a dozen backup providers that specifically work with MSPs easily. I'm trying to yep. figure out how to word this without throwing any of them under the bus. What is the price for your product? Your product is software. Your yep. product is not the cloud, the storage. It is literally software. So what yep. do you charge for your software? We charge $2 per input device. We don't charge anything for the server. And when you say the server, you mean like my server that I need to set up to operate all these agents that are getting deployed. Yeah. Yeah. That is what I mean. So Comet is a client server backup solution. As the MSP, you operate your own backup server, um, and then you deploy the agent to all of your customers' inputs. Okay. So why is it so difficult to get pricing from all of these other vendors? Like if I want to look at some of these MSP centric, like, okay, I get it. 
if they say they're channel only, so they're hiding the prices so that way my clients don't know what it costs. Whatever. That can't be the reason. That's a BS reason, right? Well, I think there's a grain of truth in it, but I don't think it's a very good reason. What I have seen, like, I do appreciate that as an MSP, you've got to make a profit, you've got to make margin. And so we sell Comet Backup. What I think is at a, at a very affordable price. Um, and you can very clearly see the difference between products that are MSP wholesale kind of oriented and then the direct to retail products, which do come in a much higher price category. And, and, and that difference is where the MSP can make margin. All right. So really? with, with you offering the pricing and, and it's right there, like we can go to your website, we can see the price. Yeah. Two bucks. And, yeah. The, I guess one of the, the things about hiding the pricing so that any customer doesn't know how much the MSP is actually upselling, you know, putting a markup on it. And the way Comet gets around that is by offering free white label rebranding. Mm. So what you would do is take Comet server and brand it as, you know, the Rocket MSP backup server. And you'd sell everyone Rocket MSP backup and it's fully rebranded. There's not a single place where you can see the word Comet anywhere. And so it doesn't matter if we advertise the price publicly on our website because it's very difficult to, to follow it back to us. Okay. And what are these other backup providers doing that you are not? Let me, I'm going to throw out Datto because I'm, when I think Datto, I think, you know, they're the Rolls Royce or whatever you want to call it of backup because they had the BDR. They were, they were like one of the first to market with such a, a fantastic solution. So that's the one that I always think of because it's turnkey. You buy it, you pay your monthly ridiculously high fee and, and they do it all. They, you know, 24 seven tech support, everything, you know, it's all, as long as you interface between the, you know, you, the MSP and the customer, they will help you with all the heavy lifting on the back end. That has been my experience. What aren't you doing? Cause they there's no way that they're providing me, you know, $2 worth of service per device. Even if I just looked at some kind of device-less, BDR-less, just cloud-only backup, they're, they're not providing me only $2 worth of, of software plus storage. Right. You're talking about the whole experience, the support. That right. Every product that comes with it. Yeah. Well, we managed to offer free support and it's working out pretty profitably for us so far. So don't see any plans to stop offering it. We, some partners, you know, there's a pretty, pretty clear bell curve between, you know, out of all of the partners that we hand and it back up, some need quite a lot of assistance and some need very little assistance and you know, raise a lot more support queries and book support calls with us. And, and some people raise very few relative to the size of their business, which is, which is great for us because it's much more profitable, but it's just part of doing business, isn't it? There's always some customers that need, and it's, it's not really a, a unique story to us, but we've at the price point that we do offer Comet at, it's working out really well. We're happy to help partners with all sorts of issues. And it's, it provides a pretty natural incentive on us to make software easier to use, which is something that you know, as you get a lot of support requests about different parts of the product, you can really see the parts that, you know, people find very easy and the parts that um, people struggle with more. And that really helps guide our development because when you consider the business as a whole, it's like, yes, we do want to um, support new application integrations, you know, so we can integrate with SQL backup, but what SQL for backup, but what if we integrated with, you know, some much more, less common database. Um, so that's one sort of competing priority for us. But the other one is because we consider the business as a whole, what, what can we do to reduce the burden on our support team? That is to make the product easier to use. One of the things, one of the specific examples about this is, is our certificates. So we were pretty early on, we saw a lot of feedback about, you know, SSL certificates being not only difficult to configure specifically, but just being not that well understood by a lot of MSPs. You know, if you're used to just clicking a button and having everything work, then being confronted with what is a private key file and where do I get an SSL certificate from, it is pretty confusing for a lot of people. So we, we put a lot of work into making Let's Encrypt and Free SSL um, very seamless to use in comments. So it's one click, you just type in the thing, the domain name you want, and it all just works. You don't need Acme, you don't need any kind of external programs to get all of this stuff working in Coit, which is great and easy. So there's some things that we can do things about. 
And some things that we can't do things about, you know, as you operate a Collet server yourself, you do kind of have to know what an IP address is and you have to know, like. So what I'm hearing is you can't fix stupid. <laughs> yeah. Based on the real knowledge, we do often end up having to explain in the tickets. And you find that the highly technical people have a much different kind of set of questions. Sure. And I, I'll assume that the MSP partners are not the ones asking what an IP address is. We only have MSP partners. Well, we have channel partners generally. So MSPs, um, specialist backup providers and some large enterprises, but it, you can, you could probably categorize them all as MSPs. But don't you sell directly to like a school if they wanted it? If they come to us directly, I guess so. I, it's, it's more about anyone who wants a, a managed. It's yeah, because we're just selling software. We're not operating a backup service for anyone. Mm -hmm. And software is for people who want to operate a backup service. So if you want to start operating the Rocket MSP backup service, it would be something to check out. But as a school, I guess you're in that middle ground of, I, as the IT department for the school, are you operating a backup service for all of the other, you know, staff and computers, or are you, do you just want to use a backup service that someone else is offering? I, well, I think, I think, I think at $2 per endpoint per month, it might be worth it. I don't know. It's always nice to, to be able to pick the wholesale option, save mm -hmm. a little bit of it. But at, at the same time, you know, at, you and I, we should be supporting our fellow MSPs. You know, that school should give an MSP and use that MSP's backup service. Absolutely. I, you know, to margin. I think all businesses should use an MSP. Okay. So <laughs> I, I want to be clear with that. But if a business came to you directly and they understood, so you're not saying you will only sell to the channel. You're just saying you will only sell to people that understand the implications of working with Comet Backup because you're, you know, you're selling a software solution, not a backup solution. Yeah. The, the software helps facilitate backups, but there's so many more pieces to the puzzle. You do have to know one or two things, but only one or two. It's really not that hard. All right. So, you know, er earlier I kind of teased about, you know, you just toss the tape in and hit go and semantic backup exec, but obviously that shows how long I've been doing IT. Things have changed, right? So I remember back with semantic, we would do a full backup every night because the, the person that was in charge of that account didn't understand differential and incremental backup. And they were too proud to listen to me or anyone else when we tried to say, Hey, there might be a better way. We don't really do like full backups anymore when we have these cloud solutions. I mean, there's the first, there's the initial backup, but everything after that, I can't even tell, is it differential? Is it incremental? Is it, does it even matter if it's one or the other anymore? Because you're constantly backing up all day long. It's not like a once a night thing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely been a sea change for the industry. I think a lot of people who have been around the block a few times will, will remember tape backups and, and doing, you know, I have a story about tape backups, which is a work with a medical practice that had a tape drive and they would put the tape in every night and they'd have a Monday tape, a Tuesday tape, a Wednesday tape. And then when the next week rolled around, they'd just overwrite the last Monday tape events. There's a lot of problems with tape backup. Obviously it's manual. Someone has to go and do it. It's error prone. There's not a lot of feedback reporting. You know, you're always writing to the tape and never reading from it. So you've got a few open questions about how reliable and repeatable this process actually is. You know, one staff member who knows how it works goes on holiday. So lots of problems there. The basic concepts of full differential and incremental backup are kind of discovered rather than invented. Something I would say it's you know, even in the distant future, you know, there's still going to be terms to represent the difference between two, two points in time. So that's something that, you know, you can always paper over it and, and comment is incremental forever. Like you say, you just do your full backup once and then you don't have to worry about any of the rest of that because comment would automatically just back up the changes forever and ever. I think comment's position on this is really interesting because we're doing this at a, a chunk level um, for block level deduplication across all of your files and, and being able to do that in an incremental forever way, I think is still a little bit rare. If you look at some other products that don't specifically talk a lot about, you know, the difference between what's a full backup and what's an incremental backup is they will either be working at a whole file 
with full file re-uploads. Or if they do, you know, look inside a file and do individual blocks, then you will have to come to terms with um, incremental algorithms all over again, just like it's the bad days. So it's, it's a really neat thing about Comet is that we can do incremental forever, even within individual files. Whereas if you look at some of the competitors, and I'm sure out of the 12 that you can recall, I can point out a couple that, you know, there is a transition phase here between the old world of the semantic net backups and the modern world of the you know, incremental forever cloud this, cloud that. And through diving through all the marketing, it can be a little bit difficult to find out where a product exactly sits on that continuum, which is something that's really interesting to look into. But you said a uh, word and all that, that I've kind of been stuck at. You said chunking. Yep. What, I mean, I refer to myself as chunky, but, but chunk, chunking, it, that is, what, what is that? Cool. Oh, sorry, I, th- I think I went a little bit, maybe too deep on the last thing in a little bit. No, it's, it's okay. It. I'm just a nerd. I want to learn things. Sure. Okay. So chunking is, you've got, this is about the concept of having a, a really big file that mm-hmm. you don't want to re-upload that same file every time it changes. And just about optimizing the bandwidth, optimizing the storage, the so, backup software so like should D- be able, yeah, in a sense, yes. But when you have a really large file and you've got, you know, yesterday's version of the file and today's version of the file, I'm saying yesterday and today, but you know, we could be saying every five minutes or something. When you've got two versions of a file, you can run a diff across them and you can see where the changes are and that will give you a little diff file plus your full file. And then you've got a, a bit of a quandary. Do you store the full file in the diff to tomorrow's version or do you do a backwards diff, store today's version and then a diff that takes you back to yesterday? But, you know, as this chain gets longer and longer, you start to run into structural issues with you can either have it be really fast to restore the oldest version and really you know, slow as you reapply all of these diffs to get back to today's version. We can have it the other way around and then it would be really slow to get old data when you need it. And so Comet, and this is where a lot of big competitors with this kind of algorithm, and Comet has broken through this problem by chunking. And chunking is a next generation technology that lets you just store the changes so it's incremental and it's incremental forever. And it's chain free. And so it is, you can restore the oldest version of any file and the newest version at the same speed. And the way we do this is we break up a file into chunks and it's always really difficult to come up with good metaphor for this. You know, you and I had a chat earlier. I think I used the concept of cutting a steak along the green and looking for where the cuts are, but I've, I've been thinking about our, our conversation. I've come up with a better metaphor. Uh, perhaps you can tell me if it's a better metaphor. The, my new metaphor that I'm going to try out on you, Steve, is um, that of a road trip. If you've, if you've got a long interstate drive and you're driving along and you take a photo every minute or something, you take, take lots of photos as you go out the window and say this is a trip that you do pretty often. One day there's a road works and you need to make a detour. And so the road changes around a certain point. And maybe the detour is longer and maybe it's shorter. Um, there's a cut out on the same road that you normally travel. And what Comet does is it looks at all your photos and it knows that this photo is always the same. And then around the detour, it's different. And then after the detour, the photo is always the same. And as long as we just store all the photos, we don't need to store the same photo twice. It's I don't know if that's a really good way of explaining it, but um, Comet is actually really neat at noticing what's different, grouping up everything into into chunks that are consistent around the detour. So no matter what kind of change happens, you know, before the change, after the change, your photos are just going to look the same. Comet only needs to store them once. Steve, sorry, Steve, you muted. Of course I was. What's really interesting is if I search on Google, backup chunking, I find it everywhere. So I, I'm not saying I don't believe you that like you've, you know, pioneered this backup chunking thing, but it sounds like this is something that all backup providers are trying to do and that you have just found a better way to do it. I think we would be over the moon if every backup provider in the world started to do it. The inventor of the chunking algorithm, I think, can be traced back to a certain Andrew Tridgell for the R-Sync 
program, if you've ever used rsync on Linux or as a feature to chunk a file um, in order to efficiently transmit it as it copies it. But taking that and applying it to backups has been a, a 10 year process and taking that and bringing it in a really cost effective way to the MSP wholesale backup market, I think is something that Coit does particularly well. And I know that it, as Coit's a somewhat newer product, I think we, we first went to market in 2017, so coming on five years, well, a bit over five years now. And you're, like you're saying, with all the semantic net backups of the world that are out, the whole structure of the program is around take first, or it's around full and incremental first or something. And, and having a product that takes chunking and uses it as its core structure from day one, I think has let us really push in a very cool direction. The neat thing about chunking is there's, there's so many neat things about it. One of the things about having, you know, what I was saying before about a chain of backups and you know, having it full and then the increments and comment not needing to do that anymore while still being incremental forever is when you've got this chain and then dips, one of the things that you do likely want to do is to merge a diff into the full. And uh, you'll see a lot of backup providers still talk about synthetic full backups with a full image and applying a diff into it. That's computation. You know, some CPU needs to do some work to process that diff and apply it into a file. And that processing simply can't be done on um, cheap cloud storage like Amazon S3 or Wasabi or Backblaze B2 because this is non-computational storage. It's like an FTP server. You can't ask an FTP server to merge a diff for you. So all of the old guard that is structured around these other algorithms really find it difficult to move to cloud storage. And you'll find that when they do support cloud storage, it comes with pretty significant caveats. You know, one of the competitors that I'm aware of that we used to work with somewhat closely would have rules like, oh, you can do a full backup and then incrementals um, up to a certain point after which you have to do a not full re-upload because the changes gets too long. And it's just these annoying things like that, that, you know, even as you take an older product and, and bring it kicking and screaming into the, the modern kind of cloud storage world, how many of your old assumptions are still there and, and what's holding you back from being, you know, the holy grail of backup, you know, incremental forever, compressed, encrypted, it works on cloud storage, which is somewhere that we've managed to end up pretty positive. So, I don't know if that actually answered your question. Sorry, I was just kind of talking. That's okay. I, I mean, I'm liking the conversation, so. No, that's good. As an MSP, you know, we're always short on time, right? There's never enough hours in the day. What features should I be looking for when I'm looking to pick out a backup platform that's going to save me time? That's a great question. I would say having worked in situations like this, where there was always more inquiries and more to check and there were hours in the day. The first thing I would say is my sympathies go out to you and hopefully it can make it easier. In, in particular, remote management has been pretty transformational, not just in the sense of being able to get a remote session to a customer's PC, but things like RMMs and, and, and that kind of insight into your customer base. One of the things Colwit does is not only gives you that single um, pane of glass over all of your customers and you can see all of their job reports. We've got this great sort of overview visualization calendar looking thing where you can see at a glance, everyone who's not backing up at all, let alone has a problem with their backup. Maybe they've selected the wrong files for backup, running out of storage quota or anything like that. So I would say the observability and just being able to reduce the friction and seeing what's going wrong and reduce the friction in being able to fix problems when they come up. So one of the neat things that you can do, we call it, is not only remotely configure all the customer's backup settings from the Colwit server without any customer intervention, but you can also remotely browse a customer's PC in order to pick and choose what files are selected for backup or what disks are selected for raw drive partition backup or what um, all the other types of backup that Colwit supports, you know, SQL Server, what SQL Server databases are installed on the system that are available for backup, what Office 365 tenants, you know, things like that. So the remote monitoring um, and remote repair, I guess I'd call it. Um, and this goes hand in hand with RMM systems for, for other general purpose MSP issues that you'd want to um, see and fix. 
All right. So is there anything that we as MSPs can do to make our backups safer from ransomware? That's a pretty deep question. I think it depends (laughs) on how safe you think your backups already are. Like if if you're talking about time machine, ransomware will get in there and destroy them. But it's, yeah, a matter of degree, I would say. You know, when when we're talking about ransomware, ransomware runs on the PC. It's broken through all of your defenses up to this point. Hopefully it hasn't. But, you know, in the event that it does break through all your defenses up to a certain point, ransomware runs on the PC. It manages to do some UAC bypass to get running as administrator. And then once it's running as administrator, a lot of bets are off. You know, it can stick its fingers into Time Machine's memory and pretend to be Time Machine that can do everything that Time Machine does, including deleting old backups. And, and it's actually the same for Comet. You know, if ransomware is running as administrator, you know, it can install a debugger, it can install Wireshark, it can intercept the, the Wasabi credentials and it puck its fingers into Comet's brain and, and just do anything Comet does. So it's a little hard to defend against sufficiently advanced ransomware. However, there's something really neat that we can do and that we can integrate with, which is a complete defense against ransomware attacks on the backup storage. So just to circle back, if you have a backup of any kind, you are almost certainly safe from ransomware. Nine times out of it, having a backup there is going to save you. Great, fantastic. We're talking about that last few percent of cases where the ransomware actually attacks the backup storage itself. So if you're backing up to a local hard drive, if you're backing up to Wasabi, or Google Cloud Storage, Amazon S3, Backbones B2, anything like that, it is possible that sufficiently advanced ransomware could use Comet's access to that location in order to break in and delete. There is some neat ways to avoid this, and they mostly revolve around storage side disk snapshotting. So if you have Backblaze B2, for instance, Backblaze B2 has a feature for versioning of the entire storage bucket. So you can configure the storage location inside Backblaze B2 so that when operation happens, like in an file add, file delete, it keeps the old thing around for 30 days, 60 days, something like this. Then Comet can be configured so that it's access to B2 does not allow it to fully delete anything, but only add a deleted version on top of an existing file. So it seems like it's gone, but really you've got this extra 30 day, 60 day buffer, during which time Backblaze will be able to roll back the entire bucket storage to an older version. And that means that even though Comet looks like it's deleting things in the storage, you know, if ransomware has done the, the Marvel movie thing, takes over, takes over your body, even in that case, you know, ransomware has turned Comet into a zombie, it's, uh, it's still not possible to lose access to your backups because of this server-side versioning system. And it's, it's really neat. You can do this on Backwards B2, you can do it on Wasabi, you can do it on a lot of different storage providers. Mm. And MSP, one of the common things to do is, you know, just starting out, a lot of small MSPs will have, you know, their PC in their garage, they'll have, you know, 100 megabit internet and a couple terabyte hard drives, go out, get Comet. Start selling backup, making money. It's all pretty easy to do. The, the system requirements are not high. And you know, you can sell a lot of backup with a couple of terabyte hard drives. But even then, we also support integrating with the system for service old versioning if you can do it yourself on self-hosted storage. So it's really neat. And I think it's, it is actually a 100% guaranteed ransomware defense. All right. Well, Mason, I got to say, man, you are filled with awesome knowledge. And I really appreciate the conversation that we got to have. Let's talk about Comet for a minute. So $2 in a node, whatever you want to call it, right? We have to set up a server. Uh, That server could be in-house. It can be AWS, Azure, wherever we want to put it. And it probably doesn't even need to be a a super expensive server because it's just the thing that's processing for us, right? That's right. If you're having all the backups go direct to Wasabi or direct to Backblaze B2, then yeah, the comment server just sits there and logs job information. You can have several thousand customers on, on, on like two gigs of RAM, if that. And having additional CPUs and, and RAM, it's not going to help the backups process faster. Yeah, we do all of it, all about processing client side. So, you know, Excellent. it's possible to go out and buy, you know, a great big Xeon, you know, four CPUs and, and 500 gigs of RAM, but that just can't actually compare to letting your customers' PCs do the work. Because if you've got, you know, 
say 200 input devices, you know, they've all got eight gigs of RAM. That, that's a lot of RAM and a lot of CPU over the entire fleet. And so that's Comet true. Was, it was really interesting to the myth. <laughs> and, but yeah, so, so Comet does all of its processing client side. So we have client side deduplication, client side encryption, um, which is really great for compliance. And yeah, that means that the Comet server that you have to operate to look at all your customers with this really lightweight. The CPU requirements go up a little bit if you are ingesting, if you want to store your customer's data yourself, if you've got some, you know, RAID array of drives and you want to store data for your customers, so some requirements are a little bit higher, but still pretty modest. And if it is too much of a burden to own and operate your own Comet server, I know a lot of um, MSPs are not just cloud first, but cloud only in this mm-hmm. in the 2021 we live in. We can host the Comet server for you for a pretty small fee but it is free to rent it yourself. And then you're only looking at $2 per input. And just throwing it out there, like you guys can set up, I don't know, I, th- I think you can even run this server on if they let you do Windows. So not Dropler. Droplet? You're thinking Drop- digital? Um, yeah, I was thinking of the droplets. Digital Ocean. <laughs> Dropler is the thing that I use to transfer files to people. And you, you don't even need Windows to code. We can back up on... Windows, Mac, and Linux inputs as well. Now, you said you had something exciting you wanted to tell everyone about, like exclusive for Rocket MSP. Exclusive for Rocket MSP, I would like to offer a promo code. If anyone goes to cometbackup.com and and signs up with the code Rocket MSP, all one word, you get free $50 account credit. So that's enough 25 input devices. If you want to try out Comet, Give it a shot for file and folder backup or disk image backup, Sabi, Backblaze, anything like that. Bring your own storage. We don't offer storage. It's only software. That's so yeah. awesome. Thank you, Mason. No problem. All right. So I, I think you guys heard it here. Go to cometbackup.com, type in Rocket MSP in the promo code section. As, as you're getting signed up, they'll give you $50 in credit. And at $2 a month for endpoints, I mean, heck, you could sign up just one device and get like, you know, two years of backups. Yeah. I don't even need my, my time machine anymore. I'm just going to, I'm just going to use Comet for two years. It'll be great. I knew I knew I'd get you around to it. All right, Mason, thanks so much for hopping on here and doing this with me. I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. You answering all of my silly questions and I, I like what you guys are doing. I do. I would love to have you come on some time and, and give us a demo and show us how everything works with, you know, doing the, the backups, the restores, the VMs getting spun up all the time. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, and, and thanks for asking the hard questions. I feel like it's, obviously there's a lot of backup providers out there. I think Comet does punch above our weight in terms of the features that we offer, the, the low price, incremental forever. Compression, client side encryption for compliance, deduplication, MSP, and, and just having all of these pieces come together. I think, you know, even though we're up against the, the pretty stiff competition of Time Machine, I think we're in a really good place. I think any MSP would be lucky to, lucky to work with us. Awesome. Yeah, but I can win a demo at some point. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hopefully we will see you back here uh, someday soon. For those of you that stuck around to the end, please like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, Please subscribe if you're listening on the podcast. And I will catch you guys at the next episode. Take care, everybody.